Good afternoon. Um, just get my Madonna headpiece sorted out here and then we're good to go. Um, so my, my name is Andy Redfern. I'm a medical oncologist at uh, Fiona Stanley. So she's uh, giving, uh, treating can a variety of cancers with various uh, kinds of medications. Um, I'm a researcher at uh, UWA and at Harry Perkins. And I also look after sort of state breast cancer services as well across WA. Um, so I do a little bit of everything really, um, certainly a, a jack of all trades won't claim to be a master of any of them in particular. And it's a little bit of an eclectic kind of um, look at what's um, been moving really in breast cancer and melanoma treatment today. Now um, in terms of choosing what to talk about, um, this is me um, back when I was in training and um, in 1991, when I qualified in Medicus, and there was about a, an article every hour produced on breast cancer and melanoma, which sounds like a lot. Um, it takes about 40 minutes to read one, so you had 20 minutes off in every hour. Unfortunately, now, uh, this is last year, it's one every 15 minutes, so you've got to really read really quick. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's 24 hours a day, so there's a lot to think about, and it's a case of deciding what to include there for in a talk like this. What's been the the best stuff. If I try and put everything in, then you'll end up feeling like this, you know, walking out. <laughs> so we'll try and cover some highlights. Um, <clears throat> first, to move to breast cancer, and there are some similarities that have happened between the two, but uh, mostly different. Um, and I hope you appreciate that slide. That took me hours. <laughs> 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 Might just do that one again, just to, you know. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Probably more than the rest of the talk put together, I don't know. But <clears throat> So how we, breast cancer has actually been not doing too badly. This is a look at 1985 compared to 2005. 2005 because it's the most recent across Australia figures. In 1985, about 28% of people who were diagnosed with breast cancer would die of it within the next five years. And by 2005, which is now 10 years ago, it had, it had dropped to 11%. So almost two-thirds of people who had died of breast cancer were already being cured by that time. You may wonder what's significant between those two dates. Um, there is one thing that leaps high, and I'm sure you've all spotted that. Um, I actually went to medical school in 1985, so since I started in medicine, <laughs> things have got so much better. I'm just assuming it's not just my entry into the medical field, but there's been some other stuff going on. I'll suggest some other ideas as to what might have improved breast cancer treatment. Now, a lot of people I've worked in, uh, in uh, England, in Scotland, I've been in New Zealand, I've been in Melbourne, across in WA, in Sydney. Um, a lot of people assume that they'll get better treatment somewhere else, wherever that may be. Um, so how does WA stack up? And this is the sort of the survival stakes, if you like, from that 2005 work. How did WA do? Obviously, you should go to Sydney or Melbourne, yeah, bigger places, um, better doctors, etc. So this is um, how um, the improvement has been over that time. I'll do that again, because I'll do that real quick. <clears throat> so our horses are off, and WA actually did pretty well. Uh, ACT, Canberra was actually slightly ahead of WA in Queensland, and Victoria, New South Wales, where, sorry? No, didn't do quite as well as us. So in fact, you'll get as good a treatment in WA as anywhere, essentially. And this is, the, in fact, a little bit more detailed look at that. Uh, this is 1983 on my side and 2005 over there. This is the number of people that die breast cancer compared to get it in each of those years. And as you can see, the number of people succumbing has been going down very satisfactorily until 2005. Now, that's 10 years ago. What's happened since then? And we do get a, a state report every year. It's usually an, it usually takes a year or two to put together. A guy called Tim Threfold at the cancer, uh, Council and at uh, Department of Health does that. And in 2012, which is the most recent report, actually it seems to have leveled off a bit. And so we seem to have had a pause. <clears throat> and so I'm going to look at why that might be and whether we can um, regain our momentum. So we've got why, is, why high? Why is survival high in the first place? Why is it improved? And also, can we mend the trend? Can we keep on going towards zero deaths? Which is the uh, Pink Ribbon organization and NBCF have uh, had as their target in 2030. Now, <clears throat> um, firstly, why is survival high and why has it gone up? And I think there's two secrets to the success there. Uh, the first one is mammographic screening. We're catching tumors much smaller since mammography came along, and so easier to cure. And the other thing is preventative treatments. We give alongside surgery to try and stop cancer coming back. Looking briefly at mammography, um, and if we look at uh, 1999 compared to 1989 in the year when mammography started, it used to be only 10%, and it's gone up to about um, heading towards half of tumors are diagnosed by mammography. They've therefore been caught earlier than they would otherwise have been. And this is my, um, the other one that took the other half of the time on this talk, my mammography in a nutshell um, slide. If you look at the results of mammography, and there's been an enormous number of people in trials, almost half a million women have put their hands up to go in trials, which is obviously ex 
vital to find out what's going on. About 20% less chance of dying of breast cancer if you're having regular mammography versus if you're not. So that's part of the, the improvement. The other thing is what we call adjuvant treatment, which is what I do. Um, I had to come into it somewhere, obviously. Um, and that's the sort of the giving of treatments after surgery to try and stop cancer coming back. And um, <clears throat> with breast cancer, it depends on what kind you get as to how successful we've been. Though breast cancer is one disease, as with most things, it can be divided into other things. And there are basically three different kinds of breast cancer, if you like. Um, there is the most common, which is the estrum receptor positive ones. About 75% of breast cancer is that. About 10% in WA, they're a little up higher in other places, are HER2 positive. You can actually have both of these, you can get a combined form. And about 15% of people get triple negative breast cancer, which, is, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more in due course. The wins really have been in the ER positive, the Eastern driven, and the HER2 cancer. So we're going to take just a quick illustrative case for you of a 41-year-old lady, so diagnosed young, has had surgery for breast cancer. She's had a 3-centimetre breast cancer. It was called a grade 2, which is a medium aggressiveness. Um, one lymph node was affected when they removed the lymph nodes from under the arm, and it was Eastern and HER2 positive. Now, if we look at this lady's treatment, her cancer return risk over the next 10 years back in 1985, would have been about 60%, pretty high, over 10 years. And if we look at the evolution of what we would have done for this person over time, firstly, we're looking at 40% cure um, and 100 AD is when they actually started a fairly significant breast cancer surgery, so that's been going on a long time. Basic chemotherapies came along, and that would have added about 20% to a cure rate straight away for this type of cancer. We then look at more advanced chemotherapies, another 10%. And then looking at adding tamoxifen, the most simple of anti-estrogen treatments. Then looking at adding a, a slightly more advanced anti-estrogen treatment after tamoxifen. And we're up now at 85% cure from 40. And then adding Herceptin for the HER2 aspect of it, almost halves the risk again. And so this is taking a case that makes us look good, basically. She would benefit from everything we've got to offer. And her risk goes from 60% down to about 7%. So this kind of diagnosis and treatment is a lot of what's driven that uh, improvement in survival. <clears throat> Can we mend the trend? And I'm going to talk about the HER2 and ER positive cancer a bit longer before I come to triple negative breast cancer, which is really our area of need here. <clears throat> so this is, can we get back on track? Because we did come down beautifully from about 30 to about 10% of people succumbing. Can we tidy up and finish that last 10% of people? And in the ER and HER2 positive cancers, there are a lot of new drugs that have come along, but it takes quite some time to for them to start curing people. The way we cure people tends to be when we give the drug. When people have had an operation, they may have microscopic cells and we're eradicating those cells. It's much harder to cure people, even with the best drugs, when they've got advanced cancer, where we are making a little bit of headway there. And so we tend to find that when we get a new drug that's really good, it tends to make people live longer who've got advanced cancer but doesn't cure them. But then when we put it in the very early stage, we then add to the cure rate. And that's what's happened with, say, tamoxifen, with chemo, and with Herceptin. They've all added when we've given it at the beginning. So we've had quite a lot of new drugs, and in, like this year, there's been four new drugs in the market, more than in any other five-year period for breast cancer. So that's just in 2015, which isn't even over yet. So things have certainly been accelerating. If we look, and uh, there's a few graphs in here which I apologize for, and I'll, I'll try and interpret them. This is uh, the survival of estrogen receptor-positive breast cancer, looking at the 90s compared to the 2000s. And a higher curve means less people are dying. This is the number of people that survive, 100%, and as it goes downwards, that's people not surviving. If we look in the 90s, then five-year survival was 18% in this particular study um, for ER-positive breast cancer. And if we look in the 2000s, it's 45%. That's the number of people that are still going at five years. So a vast difference, <laughs> almost three times better. Now, we tend to think when we're treating estrogen receptor-positive breast cancer, we've got estrogen, we block estrogen, estrogen's bad, we get rid of estrogen, that's good. And if we can just stop estrogen doing its job, then will be able to cure the cancer. It's a straightforward growth highway, if you like, and this is the pathway that estrogen takes through the system. If you can block this, you're good. So we're thinking by giving tamoxifen or some other drug, that's, we do see very good results, and cancers shrink and, and sometimes completely disappear. Unfortunately, however, the cancers, in, especially in the advanced setting, often return, and that's because um, though this is our concept of an estrogen pathway in the cell, so we've got estrogen coming in, this is the estrogen receptor, which we look for in cells, and it goes to the DNA and switches it on, and you get growth and proliferation. So you get a bigger tumor, you get cells spreading to other areas. So that's what estrogen is doing, and if we block estrogen, then um, we'll stop that. 
in reality, and, and some people's tumors do look like that. I've got a lady who's 15 years in with advanced breast cancer who's still on the same anti estrogen treatment. But that's not the majority. And most people's cancers actually look more like this. And there are other pathways that growth can take through the cell. When we block estrogen, these are switched off, but they get switched on over time. And then the cancer starts growing again. And so we're looking at ways of hitting these other routes. So instead of the road looking like this, the road kind of looks like this. Um, we haven't got you this yet in uh, Perth. This is more like in Sydney or something, I guess. But, you know, <laughs> around about half past eight in the morning. We're, we're lucky. We look more like the other things still, thankfully. <clears throat> and that we've now got various uh, sort of weapons, if you like, to hit these various targeted roads. And um, we're now starting to get some trials where we're adding to the estrogen pathway blocking. Um, we've got three drugs that are all now available to, to women in WA. And this is, uh, this is the name of the pathway, which I worry too much about the pathways, but these are all bypass pathways. These are the drugs, and all these are now become available. And this is the length of extra survival, uh, control people got when they had advanced cancer, from three to seven months for this one, from three to 14 months from this one, and this one, eight months to 26 months. And these are all drugs that are making people live longer with advanced disease, and we're now going to try these in the preventative setting, and we expect these will probably impure, prove that 11% of people getting cancer back even further. Looking at HER2 positive cancers, and this is the other success story. Um, again, another graph, for which I apologize, but for HER2 positive cancer in the 1990s, 5% of people alive at five years. In the 2000s, 45%, and this is still improving, so there's been a, and that's with the advance, particularly of the drug Herceptin. This is a, a little, um, a lot of people who give cancer talks call these cartoons. I, I always expect Mickey Mouse to walk on when I say cartoons, a diagram anyway, of an animation. And this is the HER2 molecule. This is outside of a cell. This is inside a cancer cell. And this is the skin of the cell, the membrane. So, and HER2 sits in the membrane. And what it does is it detects growth signals coming in. And that activates this molecule, the HER2 molecule. And it sends off growth signal, which makes the gr cell grow, divide, and move around the body. And the drug Herceptin, or Trastuzumab, which you may have heard of, has been available in Australia for advanced disease since about 2000, for early disease since about 2006, actually sticks to this um, uh, molecule and switches off the growth signal. Because when it starts the signal, the cells just die, and it's extremely effective. However, unfortunately, again, there are bypass mechanisms, and the cell in time manages to get past the Herceptin and regain its growth signal. But now we have quite a few new drugs that help block that bypass, and they all seem to work through the HER2 molecule. We've got lapatinib, which works in, on the inside part and switches off the, the thing. We've got another antibody called pertuzumab, or pegeta, came online and was available to uh, West Australians about two months ago. Uh, and also there's something that's really the original magic bullet concept, which is a septin with a chemo mo chemotherapy molecule attached so the, the, this the drug only goes to the cancer cells and nowhere else so very good results very low side effects <clears throat> and the, tr the, the results in women with advanced HER2 positive breast cancer have been extremely good it has to be said if you'd had HER2 positive breast cancer in advanced type in 1995 sorry the average length of time and here's the analogies the light at the end of the tunnel at least getting to five years 17 months average survival with uh, advanced cancer. 2005, when Herceptin came along, it had gone to 31 months. And the most recent publications from earlier this year, and a drug that's now available, 57 months, so now, now five years average survival. That means half the people are going past five years, and that's with advanced cancer. So we believe when we bring these, this a new drug into the early setting, we're going to see that 11% drop still further. So that's the good stuff. Those are the new drugs, and I think we will mend the trend, and we will start to see further improvements. Where we're not seeing much movement is in triple negative breast cancer. Triple negative is really a description of our ignorance. Negative means there's three things that we measure and they're not there. But there are many, many other things in a cancer cell that we don't measure that are there. For triple negative breast cancer, it's about 5% survival in the 90s with advanced breast cancer. And advanced breast cancer in the 2000s, about 8%, so the same. Unlike those huge benefits for those other times. And we're now starting to learn a lot more about triple negative breast cancer. And we're finding, it like breast cancer as a whole, it's not just one thing. People tend to say triple negative is a single concept. Um, but <clears throat> when we measure 
estrogen receptors and estrogen sensitivity, or HER2. Really, it's the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's going on in a cell. And like the iceberg, there's a lot hidden underneath, and there's all these other pathways that we can also measure. So the fact that the tip of the iceberg is negative and triple negative doesn't mean that all this other stuff isn't going on below the surface that we're just not measuring. And these are the um, receptors that can be present. Just a few of them on the outside of this is a breast cancer cell I took a picture of under the electron microscope. 1988, when I first started breast cancer research, so that's nearly 30 years, but um, it's a bit faded, obviously sepia-toned, but um, these are all the receptors that you can see on a breast cancer cell, and we're not measuring this stuff or targeting it because we don't know how to yet. We are starting to. So if we look at a triple negative breast cancer, we're actually finding in the most recent sort of confirmed report is that actually can be uh, divided into seven different groups. We're starting to get into quite rare tumours here because we're looking at 15% triple negative. We're looking at about 2% in each of these groups. So if you can actually got a triple negative on one particular subtype, you actually can have quite a rare disease. These are some of the names. Um, and don't worry about them too much, but I'll take you through a couple of them just to give you a flavour. And for each one, we've also devised potential of things in white of possible treatments. These aren't confirmed, but there are things that what we found about the biology of each of these uh, types of uh, breast cancer suggests they may respond to. A couple that... Um, that are of interest. There's defective DNA repair. That's the BRCA tumors. People got the BRCA gene. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, one I won't talk about, but there's a testosterone-driven one. So actually, a bit like prostate cancer, and it's actually prostate cancer drugs that start to be good against this particular type. I will talk about a couple um, which uh, are quite important, which there's been some headway against. First is the one I mentioned, the defective DNA repair type. People who get the have got the BRCA gene. That means in the family, they carry a dodgy gene for repairing your DNA. So if their DNA gets damaged by radiation, uh, by toxins, by just general bad luck, which can also happen as well, things just break and then get fixed in the cell. <clears throat> if they can't then repair their DNA, they're more prone to get cancer. But also of interest to you is, is that the fact that when these, these cancer cells have also got bad DNA repair, we may be able to exploit that. Because when your um, DNA gets damaged, and that's by a few of the things that can damage your DNA, like uh, viral infections, radiation, chemical exposure, there's two machines, proteins in the cell, that can repair the DNA. There's BRCA, which doesn't work in people who got them. Doesn't work. Uh, just skip through about 15 minutes there. Sorry about that. <laughs> Time travel. Um, <clears throat> So BRCA is the one that doesn't work in people with the, um, inheriting BRCA carriers. And then there's PARP, which is another repair, which stands if BRCA is not working. So these go in and repair the DNA, and then you're back to rights. You've not got cancer, and the cell doesn't have to die. Um, there's two ways that the cell can repair itself, by BRCA and PARP. And when BRCA is out of the picture, then um, PARP's the only one that can do it. And these cells are much more prone to getting uh, killed by DNA-damaging drugs. And so what we've done is given cisplatin, which is a DNA damaging drug to these cancers. And the blue ones are people that have normal DNA repair. The yellow bars are the ones where people don't. And this is complete disappearance of cancers when we treat the cancer when it's in the breast. And the best results, this one was like 30 versus 60%. So we're seeing much, much better results against these kind of tumors with things that damage DNA. Um, also, um, we can also actually get rid of part. We've got things that block PARP. And when we get rid of PARP as well, these cells have got no DNA um, repair, and then they do even better. And then the cells have got nothing to do but die when they get damaged. We do find that we need to have BRCA gone. If BRCA is normal in the cancers when we treat them, it doesn't work. So in terms of 62% uh, PARP inhibitors are useful. If BRCA is not working, when you also block PARP, if BRCA is working, then you get zero. So it doesn't work. The other one I'll talk about is uh, mesenchymal tumors, and I'll talk about that because we've done a little bit of research about this. Mesenchymal tumors are ones that change. A normal cancer cell, when it's sitting there in the main cancer, is dividing, not moving around. And mesenchymal cells do move around. And so, like the, unlike the leopard, cancer cells can change their spots. They can become not growing and dividing. They can become not dividing and moving around. This is called mesenchymal change. They move from sitting in rows and growing to being migratory. And this is a quick video um, of some of the cells on the far side have, had, um, have been turned into mesenchymal cells by a, a particular treatment where we switch on a gene that makes them mesenchymal. These are not, these are normal cancer cells, and this is over just 24 hours. And um, when we activate this mesenchymal process where the cells can move around, <clears throat> they're not, there's not enough time in this uh, video for them to grow and divide on this side. So you can see these cells are starting to disperse. And... Um, 
And we do find that this kind of cell can travel around the body. These are the cells that set up shock, give you lung secondaries, bone secondaries, liver secondaries, and they also seem to be chemo-resistant. So we in Perth, we've taken locally advanced breast cancers, and we've given some chemotherapy. We've looked, and this is uh, in patients that have none of these uh, migratory cells, and the red means normal growing cancer cells. We find that when we give chemotherapy, 75% of people haven't got cancer back over about eight years. Um, and whereas when we found, and the green is when we see these migratory cells, when we did find the migratory cells, it was only 22%. So the chances of dying of a cancer were three times higher if these cells are present. Now we've got to work out what to do with this, and there has been a group over in the States that have done a screening trial. They found a couple of drugs. One is a topside, which comes from this plant, which is a chemo drug already. It's good against these cells. And thalonomycin is actually used to treat fungal infections in chickens, but it's also found to be good, and we're looking at trials in these on top of chemotherapy. Very briefly, prevention, and I, I want to get on and talk about melanoma a bit because I'm um, getting through my time here. Prevention and breast cancer. Obviously, if you allow a breast cancer to get out of hand, then it's hard to treat the mess. You want to catch this mess as early as possible. But certainly, prevention is far better than cure. This, uh, if social services are present, this isn't my child. Um, if social services aren't present, then you can get this duct tape from me at about two bucks a roll, a special <laughs> discount. <clears throat> And this is the rate of breast cancer occurring in uh, WA, so it's going up. Survival is getting better, but the number of cases is going up. And in fact, it's continued into 2012 to be the most record number of cases. So we're doing really badly with prevention. And I'm not going to talk in as a whole talk on prevention, but just to talk about recent drug treatments in terms of preventative tablets. Lots of people take cholesterol drugs to prevent heart attacks. Tamoxifen, which is one of the earlier drugs, had about a, anything between a, a quarter and a half of lowering of risk of getting breast cancer in high-risk women that took it. And there's another trial compared tamoxifen to a close relative and found about a third. And then the, the most recent trials in postmenopausal women have shown anything from a half to two-thirds reduction from the aromatase inhibitors, which work a little bit better in that group than tamoxifen. And so if you're at a high risk with a strong family history of breast cancer, then it, we're starting to work out ways to identify people we should consider for these things. So breast cancer survivors are high due to um, <clears throat> breast cancer survivors are high due to um, screening and evolving therapy to prevent return. New treatments of HER2 and uh, ER positive cancers are um, help, doing a lot towards that and should improve things further over the next five years. We're getting an increasing triple negative cancer understanding, we need to improve um, treatments. Um, new drugs groups are looking that they may be able to help there, and the aromatase inhibitors look like they may be good for prevention. Moving now to melanoma, which is a shorter part of the talk. Um, I recycled that slide. I have to make it take quite as long to do it the second time. Melanoma is... Now the, most, the most important thing with melanoma is to um, make sure that you catch it early. So if you're... This is the earliest form, less than half a millimetre thickness. This is four millimetres, which is one of the later Breslow's guy who measured thickness. If you catch it at 10 years survival, if you catch it at the half millimetre stage, is only a 4% chance melanoma catches up with you. It's almost 50% if you let it get to the 4 millimeter stage, even a very small tumor still. In terms of breast cancer at 4 millimeters, your chance of it coming back are extremely small. Probably part of this is because, like those mesenchymal cells I was showing you, melanoma is already a mesenchymal type of tumor, and they're already very migratory. It's basically got its bag packed ready to go. And this is melanoma in 2011, only four years ago. If you've got metastatic melanoma, advanced melanoma, Two years, not five years, but two years, 17% of people still were alive. And this is uh, the most recent chemotherapies in 2011, uh, only published in that time. So this is very recent. At five years, it was 6%. And I apologize here for the cricket catching an analogy. It had to happen, I guess, uh, being a Brit originally. Not that I watch it particularly. But we haven't really got any runs on the board at all in melanoma um, in 2011. But that has changed just in the last four years. We've had two very major advances. Something called BRAF blockade which is giving a bit like tamoxifen, blocking um, a, a growth signaling thing, and immune activation. Looking first at the BRAF blockade, it's another of these pathways. This is BRAF, a molecule that triggers proliferation in cells. We do, however, have BRAF inhibitors, and we've been giving those to people. About half of people have a mutated BRAF that makes this thing go crazy, makes it just drive, and that's the reason these things are cancers versus not. And BRAF blockers stop that working. And, this, and we were thinking, um, I've jumped ahead a little bit, so when we gave these drugs to people that had this particular type of melanoma, we found at six months things were going great. It was like 20% extra people were alive at six months. But unfortunately, the longer picture 
it came back together, and at two years, it was about 20 versus 20 percent again. So it was only a temporary respite. The reason is when we go and look back in the cells, again, there's a bypass thing. There's this pathway that goes around this blockade and comes back at this thing called MEC. So we made some MEC blockers, and um, we've started giving those to patients. And there has been a survival benefit at two years this time by giving both of those drugs in these melanomas of about 15 percent. So about 15 extra percent of people are alive with advanced melanoma who've got both drugs. Why is it only 15 percent? Well, there's another bypass pathway, and it starts to get real complex here. But, um, and we're with it called a PI3 kinase pathway, and we have drugs to that. And so we're now looking at a third drug, but we have to start thinking about safety and can we give all these drugs together safely. Final thing I'm going to talk about is immune activation in melanoma. And um, this is something that's really coming into all cancer. Melanoma has been the first cab off the rank. There are two molecules in, in melanoma cells that can switch off the immune system. One's called program death one, and the other one I'll just give it, it's, its name is very long, but CTLA-4. And these things are on melanoma cells and switch off the immune system. And just to give you a quick sketch of that, because it's quite exciting, and it's made a huge difference, and this thing is probably a Nobel Prize about to be delivered, I would think, to somebody. When you've got a melanoma cell, and the black things are abnormal proteins that are part of it being a cancer rather than a normal cell, you get a white cell, a lymphocyte comes along, and it's got special receptors that pick up these abnormal proteins. However, when the, 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 the lymphocyte also um, secretes some chemicals that make all our normal cells, including and melanoma cells, produce something called program death one, and the, the lymphocytes have a receptor for this. And just here, the, this is the lymphocyte recognizing that the melanoma cell is a self cell, and the, uh, the lymphocyte then wanders off and leaves the melanoma cell alone. So it's kind of like a VIP membership pass that we're giving the cancer cells with this thing. So we now have a drug which targets this program death one, binds to that thing that's telling uh, white cells that this is a normal cell. So when our uh, lymphocyte comes along, <clears throat> we've got a block here, so it can't recognize it's a normal cell. And then this is an actual melanoma cell being attacked by lymphocytes. Then the immune system is triggered and the white cells come and destroy the cell. This is our original slide I showed you just a minute or two ago. Two years, 17% survival. <clears throat> this is going to be a curve of giving a PD-1, a program death 1 inhibitor. Whereas we had 17% before, we're now seeing 49% two years survival from this drug. And we don't know. It's not been going that long. This is only 2012 these started being given. We haven't got five years to know, but this has been a vast improvement in melanoma. We haven't quite stopped there. That's CTLA-4-1 that I mentioned. This is the program death one curve. This is CTLA-4. When we stick them together, we get even better results. Again, we're pushing up past 50% of people alive at two years. The other thing is these are quite flat curves. So in fact, at two years, there's plenty of people still going, but actually it seems at three years, it's, if they actually work for you, then they work for a long time. So we may be, we're even starting to mention the C word, cure, but having only been three years out, it's a little hard. And that's the control period of having one, the other, or both drugs before we even talk about survival. The final, final thing <coughs> is, obviously, we've got this great treatment of BRAF inhibitors, which seems to give you a very good temporary effect for two years. We've got these drugs that seem to work in terms of a, a giving you a, a later effect, but for a long time. What happens if you give them together? It's only been done in mice so far. This is a PD-1 blocker. This is the cancer growing. The sharper it goes up, the quicker the growth. This is a BRAF blocker. When we give the, the double um, pathway blockers, it's better again. When we add all three, these mice, their melanomas aren't growing at all within this experiment. So there are trials now ongoing that. The only thing to talk about there, therefore, finally, and this is what governments worry, not ours, is what about the price tag? I'm not going to sing a few bars from this, uh, but uh, if I had a bit more time, I could have cut in the song. <clears throat> so this is the shopping list. What do these things cost? And this is for one year. PD-1 inhibitor, $150,000 per person per year. 189,000 CTLA-4 per year, 94,000. So you're looking at a bill of half a million dollars. Quick calculation, you can stay in a, in a premium suite at the Ritz with breakfast and dinner and dancing every night for the year for the same price. It's a lot of money for single treatment, but people are alive, not dead, and generally avoiding good quality of life. The thing that uh, to mention about price, though, is that this is that while the drugs are in patent, when drugs come off patent, things get a lot cheaper. So there's this hiatus. And so to summarize the melanoma side of things, 
Early diagnosis remains paramount, so we still want people to come forward if they're at all suspicious about anything and, and say, what about this doctor? Because that's still the best way to not die of melanoma. However, until recently, it was looking very grim, with less than 20% of people still alive at two years with advanced melanoma, have alone thinking about five years. But there's been a big benefit in, the, in early treatment with BRAF inhibitors and MEK inhibitors, those two pathway blockers, and a big benefit in later in the later phase for a smaller number of people, but a bigger benefit from those immune treatments. And we're pushing things up to 50% and beyond with the, uh, those treatments. And potentially putting both in place, though very expensive, may be very effective. So <clears throat> this is a, a quote um, from Henry Ellsworth, who's the Commissioner of the Uses Patents Office. All this research has done some amazing things for some people. And so, surely, this summarizes, surely things have gone so far that the science has done what it can, and they're just two hard basket cases that we won't be able to sort out. However, Henry Ellsworth said that nothing else can be found in 1849, and there have been a few inventions since then. So hopefully your card isn't too overloaded. Um, thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. <coughs>